she has added to my sermon today, Maria has, because I want to think about being in church, being the right kind of church. And I have a list of things for you that you need to be doing or being in order to be a church. And then in her presentation, she's given you one more. So uh, bear that in mind as we think about this, because certainly my list is not exhaustive. It is, uh, it is one that uh, uh, is, is important. Ah, you guys want to sit with him? It's okay. We're just sitting here crying. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. Surprise. get you one more row down here. We'll get you to the mourner's bench and we'll have a great time together. All right. All right. Genesis chapter 2. Now, it, admittedly, this verse is not the starting point. It is the arrival point. You all know preachers, especially me, I like to take a passage and then I try to break it down and I try to move us logically through the passage and let it speak to us. And so it is still true with this passage. But instead of starting there, I want to end there. And we will come back to it in a minute, but I, I want you to continue to have this verse in your mind as I share with you about the church. In verse 8 of chapter 2, it says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. On Sunday nights, we've been talking about the presence of God in a variety of places, the garden, the tabernacle, the temple, and in a person's uh, body in a person's life we are the temple of God and so that is in part the background but I'm also <coughs> thinking about this idea of what brings a person to church why do people come to church well I've been thinking about it over the last few weeks and I guess off and on through many years but uh, over the last couple of weeks had uh, other opportunities to uh, to think about it for example last Sunday I was preaching at Central Avenue Church which is where I served before coming here yes there was a two year Space in between, but we had two good years at Central Avenue, and they asked me to come back and preach a homecoming service, and so I was honored to do that and appreciative that you would allow me to do that. So I got to go and preach, and 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 that began that process of thinking: Why do people come to church? Well, homecoming's easy. Homecoming's easy. Yeah, it's easy for you, whether it's your family homecoming or a church homecoming. Uh, you you come to see old friends. That's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, you come to meet with family. That's a good thing as well. Uh, you may have other things that are going on. For example, uh, good times. Do you remember good times in church? Homecoming can remind you of those things. Uh, last weekend was homecoming for Campbellsville University. I, I knew it and then forgot it. And, uh, and so uh, while I was in Campbellsville last Saturday, yeah, it just happened to hit me. This is homecoming. And so I went downtown and I missed the parade by this much. I saw flashing red lights as the fire department wrapped up the end of the parade. But as I drove through town, there was the dean of the School of Theology, Dr. Hurchin, and uh, he was there with his family. And, and you can't help but see folks like that or parades or homecoming without remembering <coughs> some good times. And so I think sometimes people come to church for, for that very reason. It's good to come to church and remember some of the good times in your life now that one's easy so 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 that's one uh, Maria has given us one so that would make us two and that's helping people with their scars with their hurting and with the healing that is required let me share a few more that are very very important to us one is uh, acceptance people come to church for acceptance they, they come to church in order to be accepted for who they are they don't want to be looked down upon. They don't want to be critiqued. They don't want to be criticized. They don't want to be made fun of. They don't want people to look down their noses at them. They want to come to church in order to be who they are. They want to be accepted for where they are in their lives. People who are out in the world who would come to church for one reason or another would come, but they want to be accepted. You don't want to come to church and feel like you don't belong, you're not wanted, and everybody's looking at you. That's a horrible feeling. Maybe you've experienced that. I've experienced that. And you say, how can that be? You're the preacher. Well, I have always been. 
Sometimes I've gone back to churches where I pastored and I didn't feel like they wanted me and I didn't fit in and said I would never go back. People long for acceptance. Just a couple weeks ago we used it, at least in part as text that, that you know and know well. And that is the, the, the story of the prodigal son. And as I mentioned that, uh, I suggested to you that, that one of the things that was going on in that story, and I know it's a deep and full and rich story, is that prodigal son who had gone away and, and wasted himself in, in uh, unfaithful and righteous living. And as he came home, all he wanted was for somebody to accept him. He wasn't worried about his past. He wasn't worried about his mistakes. He just said, you know, I'm living like this, but if I could just go home, my daddy would hire me. He didn't ask for an inheritance. He didn't ask for his room back. He didn't ask for a new set of clothes. He didn't ask for anything, except he just hoped that would take him for where he was in his situation in life. You know the story, don't you? The daddy did accept him. Now, the daddy did even more because the story represents God and how he will welcome us. But let me assure you that based on that story and many others in the scriptures, what we see is that people, when they come back to God or to God for the first time, they just simply want acceptance. We need to be a church that's open-minded. We don't have to condone sin. We don't have to like sin. We don't have to permit sin. And when people come to us, we don't have to say, it's okay, just go live any way you want to. No, we don't have to do that. But when they come in the door, we need to accept them for who they are and where they are. And then we can move forward from that position, from that place. I want to be accepted for who I am. Let me give you another reason people come to church. It's safety. <coughs> people come to church to be safe. And you can look at that in a number of different ways. A number of ways. Sometimes it's emotional safety. Uh, it's spiritual security. It, it, it is sometimes physical. I know I've shared the story with you, and I don't think too many uh, uh, months back. But let me share a story with you that seems like it's right out of the movies. You all remember the movies where the bad guys do things, and they, they, they end up going into the church, and they, uh, they declare sanctuary, you know, so that, so that the, the authorities or whoever comes in, uh, uh, you know, won't, uh, won't get them. It's an Old Testament picture of grabbing the horns of the altar. It's there. I think it was just a couple weeks ago maybe I shared this with you, but in a different context. And there are folks that still come into the church that need safety. They need a place to go. They need a place to be. They, they might just need to get in out of the rain and the cold. But there are times when people need to be safe. We were at Bardstown Baptist Church where I was on staff as a, as a, a seminary student. And, and our offices were on one side of the building. The mailbox was on the other side of the building. It was similar in design like this one right here. A little bit larger but we would have to go from here to here and so the secretary went up the office one one Monday morning and she walked across the auditorium and we heard her scream ah! and so we rushed to see what's going on and she ran back to the office what's wrong she said there's a man asleep on the front queue mm -hmm. now their church was a lot like our church I'll tell you what people tell me all the time they come up here and there's a door open <laughs> they had more doors than we did, and we had a we do we had we had a number of times. You could go about any time find a door open. Man needed a place to sleep. It was cold outside. Night. He wanted safety. I know I've shared with you the time when I was the associate pastor in Wimbledon, and I lived in the parsonage, which was just right right next to the church. And they called me over and said, "Help, help, 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 help!" And I thought they were kidding me. And I went in, and, and I thought, well, I'm the new guy. You all remember that? It was a few weeks ago I shared it with you. And said, uh, I thought they were pulling my leg. You know, let's get it. Let's get it. So I went over. And, and we had two secretaries. And so when I got to the office, and I mean, I just got up and ran. I said, all right, I'll play their game. So I got up and ran. And I, and I went to the church, and, I, and I, I thought they were just playing until I tried to get in the office itself. Because you could get in the outside door of the church, but not the office. And I got to the office, and the door was locked. And I'm having to beat on the door. And I'm, I'm saying, what's going on? And they said, oh, this person just came through. This lady just ran through screaming and hollering and saying, they're after me. They're after me. They're after me. And then she took off down the hall and we locked the door. And I did what any associate pastor who's stupid would do. I said, I go find her. 
<laughs> and they said, no, no. And so I went out the door and said, lock the door behind me. It'll be all right. And this lady had never been out of church before. I want to tell you what. I found her in the auditorium sitting on the first or second seat about where you are. You know what she was doing? Playing the safety. Because they were after her. The authorities were looking for her. She wasn't a crook. In her case, she had some mental issues. And her caregivers were looking for her. And she'd run a city block trying to get away from them. But that tells me that people know, even when they're not in their right minds, they know that the church is a place of safety. And so our church must be a place of safety and security. People are looking for that in their lives. <coughs> I guess they have been here seven years, so it must have been eight, nine years ago. Time flies. Time flies. That was the time I was down in Key West, Florida. And uh, I happened to be there about this time of year. It was Halloween. And in Key West, Florida, on Halloween, they have a little festival. It's called Fantasy Week. I can assure you that none of you have an imagination that's vile enough to think about what they do. So that's when I showed up, quite by accident. So I parked my bike, and I went down to the Bud Rucker's hamburgers over there on Duval Street in Key West, and I bought my hamburger. And then I walked down Duval Street, which is where everything takes place. That's where they have their parade. It lasts for several days. And, uh, and it was bad, and I was there early. <laughs> they hadn't got wound up yet. It was a horrible thing, horrible. I sounded like Trump, it was horrible, horrible. Um, <laughs> about halfway down the Ball Street there on the left was the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church in recent years has been known to be a very liberal organization. It certainly was not Southern Baptist. They might even allow or endorse or permit some of the things that I was seeing out on the street. But I went up the steps of this church just hoping, is there any way this church is open? It wouldn't be. If we were experiencing what they experienced, you'd close your doors. I'll guarantee it. I'd close them too. But I said, is there any chance? And so I opened the door. It was open, and I went inside this auditorium, and there was nobody there but me. And it was a huge auditorium. It was big. And I realized as I stood there in this place of religious liberality, I realized that despite all that, I was safe in the presence of God and I was not out in the world where all the evil was taking place. I have never been so thankful <coughs> as I was that day. Folks are still coming to church to be safe because the world outside is evil. And when they come in, we have to understand they're coming with all the experiences and baggage and all the things that they have. But when they come, they're looking for some safety. And we need to provide that for them. Another reason people come to church is because they're looking for forgiveness. They know what's been going on in their lives. They need forgiveness. They understand it. Let me share forgiveness with a, 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 a three different uh, ways to think about it. Forgiveness sometimes is a fresh start. They just need to start over. That's what forgiveness does for people. It gets the past out of the way so that they can make that new beginning. It is a, a way of fixing the past. Yeah, we did it. We're sorry. We're not doing it again. How can I make it better? Even if I can't make it right. Forgiveness provides that for them. Some will come in and say, I've hit rock bottom. There's no place else to go. What's next? Forgiveness is a good place to start. Now, there's two aspects of forgiveness, and I'd be remiss not to mention them. Number one is, yes, we need to offer forgiveness. We need to also accept forgiveness. In other words, the church must be willing to forgive no matter what the sin is, no matter what, we have to be willing to forgive. Can you imagine Jesus on the cross saying, I am dying for you. I am dying that you might be forgiven, except you. I don't like what you did. <coughs> not what he does, is it? 
Jesus died in order that everybody might be saved. And so we need to be in the business of practicing forgiveness. I am not overlooking justice. I am not overlooking <coughs> care, responsibility. I'm not overlooking discipline, but I am saying we must offer forgiveness. Now, it's also true that when people come for safety, for security, for forgiveness, we accept them where they are. We sing the song, don't we? Just as I am. Do we mean it? Do we allow people to come just as they are? Is that true? Or is it just fun little song to sing at the end of what we used to do at the Billy Graham crusade? We must be a people who gives forgiveness. And then after that forgiveness, now we disciple, we train, we build up, we educate, because we don't want them to stay there. We want them to grow. We want them to change. Everything we do is about change. Folks, I see a lot of young people here today. If you don't change, you'll never grow up. I see young adults. If you don't change, you'll never be mature. Change is what it's about. So forgiveness, yes. And then we begin the process of growing up in the Lord. Let me give you a third one. It seems like the same thing, and in a way it is. Uh, I say third, and we're up about four or five here. How about redemption? People come to church to get redemption. They come to get something new. They need something fresh and new and vital in their lives. And so they come here looking for it. And we should be able to provide it for them. Now, let me give you some other things that, that I think describe what redemption is. Redemption is also hope. We live in a world that's filled with hopelessness. Redemption is grace. Redemption is salvation. We must offer them these things. This must be a place for this. I said for many years that if I ever started a church, I would name it Grace Baptist Church because we would be offering grace, hope, newness, redemption. That's what the church must be. That's what people come looking for. Now, we're back to the text. You see, we move towards it because there's one other thing that people look for when they come to church. And we must make sure that we offer this as well, or we are really coming up short as a church. People come looking for a future. What are you talking about? Fresh start and forgiveness and, and moving forward, but they come looking for a future. They come looking for heaven. They come looking for a better day tomorrow than they had yesterday. They come looking for God in that aspect. It's amazing. The scriptures even tell us, you know, that even pagans know what's right and wrong. So even they can come to the church saying, man, I need to find God. I, I want to go to heaven when I die. I'm looking for a bright future. And that's what we offer. Here it is right early in the scriptures. In fact, uh, Ken Ham and the Creation Museum would be so proud of us today just hearing this because the future is this. It's in Genesis here I'm singling out chapter 2. The Lord God planted a garden in the east. And there he put a man. Folks, after we got kicked out of the garden, we've been spending the, the millennia trying to get back into the garden. That's our hope. That's our future. Not just folks outside the door, but Christians. We hope for this too. Why did I pick the garden out of all these stories in the scripture about heaven? Well, because it starts here. And we've studied this on Sunday nights. We've looked at the, 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 the garden. We've looked at the tabernacle. We've looked at the temple. We've looked at us as the, re the, the, the receptacle of the Holy Spirit. We've looked at these things. And here we see this. Why is this heaven? Why do I know the garden of Eden is heaven? Because that's where God is. He would come down and talk with Adam. And they would have conversations and they would walk together. And isn't that what we're trying to do? To get to heaven, to be with Jesus, to be with God? Folks come to church because they're longing for a brighter future. They're longing for heaven. That's where they want to go when they die. And that's why they come. Now this is my picture of a church and why people would want to come to any church. 
your church in Louisville, your all's church down in Tennessee, this church right here. Are we that kind of church? I know of churches that are not. I know of churches that are putting for sale signs up, and I can tell you why. Some of them I know very well. I can tell you why. Let me go through the list. There aren't any good members there. Bad members. They don't accept people. I pastored one church that's very proud of our growth record, but I was very disappointed because they were running them off faster than we could bring them in. That's true. They weren't accepted. It was not a place of safety. It was certainly not where forgiveness was offered. <coughs> it was not a place for redemption. And there was no future there. It's taken 25 years to put the sign in the front yard. But it's probably done. These things are what people are looking for when they come in the doors of the church. How about that? about your own church today. Do these things strike a chord with you? I think they're all right out of scripture and out of experience and they are all pointing to that last one. Someday. It's got a different name in Revelation. Someday. Won't it be nice to walk in a garden? To walk with God. May we be the kind of church that offers that kind of experience That's not just lost. That's saved. That's just not new people. That's members. Don't we need security, safety, forgiveness, hope? That's the church. May you always be a true picture of the true church. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your word and for the truths that you share in it and for how you desire for us to be with you. You put us in a garden. It's our fault that we're not there. Now, Lord, we're trying to get back. And as we make that attempt to be your church, to be the presence of Christ in the world today, may we be the church that is safe and forgiving and accepting. May we be the church that offers redemption and hope. May we be the church that helps us heal scars and deep wounds. Lord, may we today truly be the presence of Christ in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.